very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dolores, uh, for that uh, introduction. And indeed, thank you also to the organisers in UCD for the opportunity to contribute to this workshop uh, today. I think this is a, a really exciting topic. Um, as Dolores introduced, I'm a principal investigator in Singapore, and I um, have a team that works closely on uh, how sensory cues influence energy selection, energy consumption, and, um, and ultimately satiety. And we became interested in this processed food debate a number of years ago, stimulated by the rise in interest around the Nova classification system, and specifically interested also because of the um, influence of uh, Nova on uh, how distinct they were around the, the role of processing rather than nutrients in terms of uh, energy intake and health. So the central tenet of the Nova system is that uh, it's not nutrients we should be concerned about, it's actually um, the processes. And so not saturated fat or salt or energy per se, but rather things like extrusion and milling, freezing, fermenting and spray drying. And so when this came out and, and when it became uh, widely publicised, um, a number of us in the community developed some concerns around this um, because, of course, there's a, most of the dietary guidelines today are based primarily around nutrient intake. And so uh, several debates were had a number of years ago around this topic, uh, specifically around some of the shortcomings of the NOVA system, and particularly also, more importantly, I think, on the lack of evidence for certain claims made around the role of processing in energy intake. And uh, we contributed to this debate with some colleagues from UCD a, a few years ago, and, and articulated some concerns, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter anymore about the NOVA system, whether you agree or disagree with it, because we're going to be talking about food processing and ways to improve the food supply regardless. And in today, there's actually over a half a dozen countries that are already starting to make recommendations around avoiding uh, ultra-processed foods. Um, I'm interested primarily today in talking about the evidence around energy intake and ultra-processed foods, and then some of the potential mechanisms that might stimulate uh, that energy intake. And at worst case scenario, ultra processing is a proxy measure for high energy dense foods that might promote excess calorie intakes. And so let's talk about one of the reasons or some of the reasons why that might be the case. Um, so if we look uh, specifically at what uh, is said about ultra processed foods, and this is the quote from the PAHO organization in, in South America. They state that ultra processed foods are hyper palatable and habit forming and are oftentimes quasi addictive. And that certain taste properties are engineered into these foods by food technologies, and that they ultimately disrupt and skew the digestive system in the brain and, and satiety and appetite. And so, through this, they can uh, cause overconsumption. And so, we discussed this in our own uh, commentary several years ago. That where is the evidence around hyperpalatability and addictive? What's the evidence to support claims around weak satiety? And ultimately, do ultra processed foods disrupt this taste nutrient relationship that uh, we associate? Uh, where nutrients in our near environment can be sensed and, and ultimately their intake can be regulated because we can detect them. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence around some of those claims and then potentially some of the mechanisms around energy intake uh, associated with this category of foods. And there is a very wide range of epidemiological evidence. Uh, over 250 articles have been published to date looking at the link between ultra processed foods and, and energy intake and risks of overweight and obesity. Um, I'm not going to get into the epidemiological evidence this morning. Others will speak to this. There is, of course, an overlap in terms of if the vast majority of the energy in the food supply is categorized as ultra processed, you do tend to find strong relationships. But even then, not all, not all analyses have shown that in, in terms of the association studies. But instead, I'm going to talk about the one randomized uh, controlled trial that's been done to date, looking at the impact of ultra processed food consumption on uh, energy intake when compared to an unprocessed uh, diet. And so this was uh, led by Dr. Kevin Hall in the NIH in the US, and I was uh, invited to contribute some measures to this study when it was ran in 2018 and published in 2019. And so we were able to include some measures around sensory properties, around food liking and palatability, and around behaviours um, associated with the consumption of the meals in this trial. For those not familiar with the trial, um, it was a four-week inpatient uh, ad libitum feeding trial. And so what that means is um, 20 participants were invited to the metabolic uh, center in the NIH and asked to live at the center for four consecutive weeks. Uh, these were um, normal uh, 20, 20 individuals, 10 males, 10 females, and they were randomized to two diet conditions, um, two weeks on an ultra-processed diet defined by the NOVA classification system and two weeks on an unprocessed diet. And then the crossover element as well, all participants completed both arms of the study. So they had two weeks on each diet across the four weeks. 
uh, the diets uh, comprised over 85% of each diet was uh, in line with that categorization. So if you were ultra processed, you had 85% of the calories from ultra processed foods and unprocessed the same. And the diets were matched for fats, carbohydrates and, ener and protein energy from those macronutrients and salt and fiber, although there's some, some controversy about how they were matched, but nevertheless, and energy served was equivalent across both diets. And so from a, from a research point of view, being able to study every mouthful of food that somebody eats for a full month is really a huge opportunity to start to understand how meals impact energy intake and how we adapt our energy intake and food uh, intake behaviors to the previous meals and subsequent meals. So we, we don't really often get this kind of control over monitoring uh, how much energy people consume. And um, so this is really a, a very advanced study in that regard. And um, we can really track very closely what people eat over the course of these two weeks. And the results were, were quite striking at the time when we came out. There was, uh, on average, across the uh, two weeks, uh, people on average consumed over 500 calories more on the ultra-processed diet. And uh, they consumed um, less on the unprocessed diet. And of course, it, when you consume 500 calories more for two consecutive weeks, you end up with weight gain. And there was about a kilo of weight gain, which was predominantly fat mass accumulated on the ultra processed diet, whereas energy intake went down on the unprocessed diet. And so the question I want to pose in today's talk is why was that? Uh, the whole study was not designed to identify the mechanisms by which uh, we uh, overconsume. It was purely a comparison, but we're of course free to speculate on the putative mechanisms previously suggested by the PAHO uh, group, for example. Is it because the foods were hyper palatable, for example, and that they intended to promote some kind of an addictive like behavior or quasi addictive behavior within uh, each diet? And so, for those that are familiar or not familiar with the hyper palatability idea, this is a sort of a loose term that's used to describe um, some uh, malevolent forces in the food industry that engineers in this um, supra palatable or supra um, strong hedonic response through combinations of salt, sugar, and fat and processing aids, which um, render you um, powerless to the, to, the, to the sensory qualities of a food and drive intake up uh, significantly. And so some, some vague attempts have been made to define this in the past, but to date, there's no formal evidence to suggest that there is such a phenomenon as hyperpalatability above and beyond palatability. And of course, in food intake behavior, we know that palatability can have a strong impact on intake. But we also know that we have biological systems to counter that, things like sensory specific satiety reduce our intake uh, within meals. And when we looked at the liking data from the whole study, we see that across both diets, there was no significant difference in energy, or sorry, in terms of pleasantness or familiarity from each diet. Overall, each diet was equally liked and equally familiar. Now we have, a, as, an, as an author, I've been able to go back and look at the raw data as well and see that actually liking does drive intake. And when we look at it on an individual level and across individual meals, People who like certain meals more tend to eat more of it, but this was equivalent across both unprocessed and ultra-processed diets. In both cases, um, there was no unique contribution by one of the diets to liking's impact on intake. What was interesting was that um, although energy density served was equivalent, energy density consumed was not. And so people were free to eat ad libitum so they could consume what they liked off each of the individual plates. And so in the ultra processed diet, people tended to levitate towards some of the more higher energy dense components in the meals, which led to an increase in energy density consumed. And for anyone that's familiar with the work of Barbara Rolls, you'll know that higher energy density promotes higher energy intake. And across many, many studies, this has been demonstrated to be true, whether it be in men and or women or adults or children across a wide range of weight classes, whether you consume the higher energy density for breakfast, lunch or dinner, whether the energy comes from fats or carbohydrates, whether it's a short-term study or a long-term study, higher energy density drives intake up. And we've also shown that we only compensate for approximately one in five of the calorie deviations in terms of uh, covert manipulation of energy density. So it's a compelling argument that potentially energy density is one, at least one of the mechanisms by which people were consuming this additional amount of energy in the ultra-processed diet. In addition, we could speculate that perhaps it's that you get less fullness for these ultra processed foods and you get a weak satiety response. And actually, we've been able to look at that. We included satiety measures, and these are some summary measures, but we've also looked at the raw data um, pre and post meal for each of the unprocessed and ultra processed diets. And again, there's no difference whatsoever in fullness um, or hunger post meal. And it's also reflected in the behavioral satiety measure. All of the intake differences were primarily driven by. A consumption of energy to satiation, so within meals, but no difference whatsoever in snack intake across the two diets either, suggesting that people felt equally full at the end of 
uh, each of the diets and that there was no spontaneous um, disruption of appetite. Um, and of course, the suggestion is that processing may disrupt uh, normal conventional taste nutrient relationships. And this is a really interesting area and one that we've done some work on here in Singapore and that's been researched uh, extensively in, in the Netherlands as well. And so research from my colleague, uh, Dr. Pezio Cho in Singapore uh, has shown this taste nutrient relationship um, in the past. She's taken uh, about 900 foods, so from Europe and from Asia, and run sensory uh, panels on these foods to uh, rate the intensity of the predominant taste characteristic of each food. And then you can correlate that rated taste intensity back to the presence of the substrate in each of those foods. So for example, a sweetness uh, is strongly correlated with uh, mono and disaccharide content. Umami taste is strongly correlated with protein content. Saltiness is strongly correlated with salt content or sodium content. And fat taste uh, sensation is strongly correlated with fat content. And this has been seen in the Netherlands, in Malaysia, but also in the US, Australia, and more recently in Singapore. But what we also did in Singapore was to look at whether this relationship is somehow disrupted when you compare these across unprocessed and highly processed foods uh, based on this principle that perhaps processing is damaging that the signal to noise uh, between taste and its nutrient content. And actually we don't see that. We see that sugar content still predicts sweetness, salt content still predicts uh, saltiness across all level of processed uh, and unprocessed foods. And of course the strength of those relationships deviates slightly um, across these 270 or so foods in that certain processed foods, of course, contain more salt, so the, the, the relationship might be stronger. But overall, um, the relationship is still maintained. And when we looked a bit more closely at the Singapore food environment, we were interested to know, uh, is ultra-processed food consumption perhaps driving intake up? And so looking at data from the uh, local cohort here that we are partnering with the School of Public Health on, um, we have data on the daily average energy intakes from 7,000 adult Singaporeans and we can break those energy intakes into, we'll say low energy, medium energy, high energy, and very high energy. And there's a threefold in, increase in energy across the population there from about 1200 calories a day to about 3800 calories a day. And then we know what foods they've eaten as well in terms of the estimation of that energy intake. So we can break those foods into their relative processing categories. And what we see is that, um, although there's a threefold increase in energy intake within this population, there's really only a 3% increase in the actual consumption of ultra processed foods. So it's not the case that um, ultra-processed foods are making unique or disproportionate contributions to daily energy intakes within this cohort. When people eat more, they eat more of all kinds of foods, not necessarily just ultra-processed foods. And so I wouldn't say that what we've got here is definitive evidence that none of these things are true, but I would certainly say that when we go looking for these relationships, we can't seem to find them. And so further research is probably needed to test whether or not, you know, palatability is uniquely attributed to ultra processed food or that there's differences in appetite. Uh, but certainly in the short term, I don't think we should be trying to attribute differences in intake exclusively to these kinds of mechanisms. So for the rest of the talk, I'd just like to highlight a couple of potential mechanisms that I think are um, likely to be responsible for the differences in intake that we observed in the whole study at least. Um, and the first of, of those I've already mentioned in terms of higher energy density, um, we can see that energy density consumed certainly had a, an increase um, in the UPS arm and definitely was associated with that uh, increased intake on a daily basis. And at least it's potentially partial, uh, a partial uh, component of the mechanism. But something you may be less familiar with is this idea of the energy intake rate, which is a combination of the nutritive property of the food, but also the behaviors exhibited around its consumption. Um, one of the measures we did have in the whole study was this measure of um, eating rate. We could actually track how quickly people were consuming food within each meal and across all of their meals. And we saw that on average and in a consistent way, uh, the ultra processed arm was consumed at a faster rate in terms of grams per minute. And when then we also account for that increased energy density consumed, we see that that expands to a dramatic increase in energy intake rate, about a 50% increase in energy intake rate in the ultra processed arm compared to the unprocessed arm. So that's quite interesting. And, and for those that are not familiar, there's a wide literature that we've been working on this for about 10 years now in terms of how eating rate can drive greater ad libitum energy intakes. Um, and this is a meta-analysis that we published back in 2014, showing that people who eat faster in an ad libitum um, test will tend to consume greater amounts of energy within that test. And so one question we started to ask ourselves was that perhaps maybe ultra processed foods might be uniquely uh, higher in their energy intake rates, that they're both energy dense, but also softly textured. It could be eaten very quickly. 
And so with colleagues from Wageningen University, we went back and looked at our own data because we've collected a lot of data over the last, I'd say, 10 years looking at eating rates across different countries in the UK, Switzerland, Netherlands, and of course also Singapore, and quantifying grams per minute, uh, how quickly certain foods are eaten and how slowly other foods are eaten, and then relating that back to their texture properties. And so when we did that, we pooled data from five of our own published studies and had about just under 330 foods. And when you classify them again by the NOVA system, you see that there is a wide range of energy intake rates within unprocessed, processed and ultra processed foods. And the ultra processed foods are sort of oversampled in this set because of course they also represent the predominant food source in the, in the modern food environment. But nevertheless, you see a wide range of different foods um, that vary considerably in their energy intake rate. We think this is a really interesting marker of the propensity of certain foods to drive energy and take up when they're consumed. So much so that we recently uh, published a paper, again, looking at the same uh, energy intake differences within Singapore. And so on the left hand side, you see we have the same low, medium, high and very high energy intake for the 7,000 Singaporeans we've looked at. And this time, instead of comparing them by their processing level, which really showed no difference from low to very high energy intakes, we instead split those foods by their energy intake rates, which is an objective measure that we can actually measure. We have the energy density and we have the eating rate. And so we can actually quantify the specific contribution of higher low energy intake rate foods to energy intakes. And what we found was that to go from low energy intakes in Singapore, at least uh, 1200 calories a day to the very high energy intakes, you really need to significantly increase the contribution made by high energy intake rate foods to your diet. And when we did the same sort of predictive models with the ultra processed foods, we didn't see um, we did not see this relationship. So I think this is an interesting metric that we might want to consider uh, as a measure of how risky certain foods are in terms of promoting overconsumption. And of course, I named my talk the problem and the solution. Uh, I think it's interesting. We're not here necessarily to defend all of the processed food environments, but we are. It is possible, of course, to develop uh, food processes that also slow the rate of energy intake. And we have studied this as well, and across three different proof of principle studies shown that when you add a certain amount of texture to a meal, you can both slow the rate of which it is consumed, but you can also reduce the overall energy consumed in an ad libitum setting. So with no a priori instruction, you can reduce your intake of energy by between 10 and 15% purely as a function of the sensory cues you encounter within your meal. And we've shown that this does not lead to a decrease in uh, satisfaction at the end of the meal, does not destroy the hedonic experience of eating the meal, and does not lead to compensatory eating behavior later on. This is a natural adaptation of your eating behavior in response to the cues you're experiencing in your food environment. And we think this is a great opportunity to slow the rate of intake and also reduce the rate of intake. And at the heart of this opportunity is food processing, because one of the best ways to add texture to foods is actually to just to process them in a way that actually increases their uh, time in mouth and increases the, encourages lo longer chewing cycles for each mouthful of calories that you're consuming. And so we've demonstrated this in, in a number of different studies uh, from a food structure point of view, and then recently summarized many of the different types of textures and sort of design principles for texture that can be used and applied to modern foods to both slow the rate of intake and overall reduce the uh, amount of intake. And I think this is an interesting area that we'd like to run some uh, feeding trials on that are longer term in, in the future. But you'll see that again, even with energy intake rate, I'm still talking roughly about energy density. The rate at which energy density can be consumed will also promote greater energy intake. And unless I uh, talked about a component of um, energy density is also the ability to detect energy densities at higher levels. And this idea of invisible fats is something that has been around for about 30 years now, uh, whereby we can raise the differences in fat content quite well at low taste intensities. But if we increase the taste intensity, which is often the case in many processed uh, or ultra processed foods, our ability to detect differences in fat content diminishes considerably. This was shown uh, back in the early 90s by Adam Dronowski when if you change the fat content of, for example, an icing sugar at low salt concentrations, you can discriminate between those fats quite easily. But at much higher salt con or sweet concentrations, sorry, uh, you see that the, that ability to discriminate diminishes. And it's been shown both for sweetness and for saltiness taste can actually blind us to the fat content of food and, and, and obviously facilitate the passive overconsumption. So that's my last uh, potential future mechanism for further investigation. And um, I want to conclude and say that currently at least the available evidence does not support some of the claims made about why processed foods are driving intake up. There is no formal evidence to suggest that hyper palatability is anything other than liking for high energy dense foods and is not distinct from palatability. 
And certainly research is needed to test the mechanisms by which ultra processed foods are promoting greater energy intake. We're running feeding trials here in Singapore on this. And uh, we're involved also in Kevin Hall's repeat of his ultra processed food RCT, which is scheduled to begin later this year. And there uh, with Kevin's um, input, we're, uh, the, the goal there is to try to look at the same diets that were tested in the first study, but also to add a third arm that will hopefully help to unpack some of the, the mystery around energy density and eating rate and, and, and start to establish some of the mechanisms. But one thing that's clear from our exploration of this topic is that um, it's not enough anymore to think about just food composition and reformulate foods for salt, sugar, and fat. We also really need to consider the eating behaviors of food and how consumers interact with their food. So traditionally, we've thought about nutritive qualities like uh, and made recommendations from a public health point of view or from a reformulation point of view. At an environmental level, of course, we can have a range of policies to limit on portions, mandatory calorie labeling and labeling or sugar taxes, or indeed, you know, processed food taxes, if you want. And these things certainly may have an impact on overall energy intake. But an area we're not currently considering that needs consideration in the future is to think more about how we can understand why certain foods promote greater energy intake rates and how they can also be curtailed in the future to develop perhaps like speed limits on calories uh, so that we can identify high risk foods and reformulate them both for their quantity of calories, but also for the behaviors around how they're consumed. And so with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the uh, panel discussion later. <laughs>